This is Johnny Gould's Jewish State. For those who listen, for those who are willing to listen. listen. What is the famine or non-famine situation in Gaza Strip today, Jackie? I have seen no evidence of a famine in Gaza. I don't watch Hamas propaganda. I watch videos that ordinary people make. You don't see emaciated people. People have energy, the markets are full. Now there was a point where North Gaza wasn't getting food as much because people in the south were raiding the trucks. You had these aid trucks on their way to the north and they were being raided by by uh, by Gazans in the in the south and they weren't reaching. But um, as the food, there was more and more food in the south and prices started coming down, they stopped raiding the, the trucks in the south and, uh, and trucks started arriving in the north and solved the problems. Are you still watching and listening to news channels? A tiresome stream of bulletins and programmes which you know misrepresent Gaza and Israel, that ignore key facts and amplify voices from just one side, with honourable exceptions, of course. The first words ever spoken in episode one of Johnny Gould's Jewish State, we must not have low expectations of the Palestinians. But that's what the world's media would have you believe. The slavish narrative says Gazans are helpless, living in an overcrowded prison camp, unable to escape their predicament, sitting ducks to Israeli aggression. You're being conned. Their Hamas leadership need you to continue to underwrite UNRWA and other NGOs and the human rights industry, all hijacked by perpetual generations of so-called refugees. But here's something you may be finding out today. When you strip away the Hamas videos, ordinary Gazans don't view themselves as victims at all. They're resilient, creative, great cooks. They eat good quality meat, fruits and vegetables. Well, wouldn't you if you lived off the Mediterranean coast? How do we know? Well, they upload hundreds of videos about themselves, their lifestyles and their views and freely available for all to see. And here's someone who chronicles it all, a voice you certainly won't hear on mainstream news. She just doesn't suit the story. And it's a great shame because her sources are impeccable and transparent. They're from the Gazans themselves. Our guest today describes herself as a haphazard Gaza watcher Her highly valuable resource is documented on Twitter, or X, under the handle Imshin. Imshin, real name Jackie Peleg, paints a vivid picture of Gazan society through the eyes of the people themselves. Much of the aid that gets filtered through Hamas's top-down control of every Gazan market is tinned food, typical of how the world views them with pity. They complain about the aid. It's not plain sailing, of course. It's a small landmass with a population said to be two million. It's probably not even half of that population in reality. In the run-up to October the 7th, there was some serious building renovation, restoration, road building, beach cleaning, a push for tourism in Gaza. But was that elaborate cover for what was planned that terrible morning? There's revelatory detail in every answer from Jackie, including the accidental superstar Mr. Fafo, who went from little-known YouTuber to worldwide attention. You'll hear how Joe Biden's lack of support over Israel's Rafah mission only helps to bolster Hamas inside Gaza. Palestinians are disinclined to revolt against a weakened Hamas because of, wait for it, perceived support from the US for the terror group. Anyway, 
Gazan opposition to Hamas is muted by the fact that they hate Jews more than their own terror leadership. Jackie says what many say, the Oslo Accords only succeeded in dividing Israelis from Palestinians. It cut ties which had been previously warm and hospitable. They even went to each other's weddings and celebrations. But Israel's 2005 withdrawal gives Hamas hope that continued violence will work to eliminate the Jews from the rest of Israel. This is a gripping interview from start to finish, full of insightful observations and detailed revelations. This is hashtag the Gaza you don't see. This is Imshin, Jackie Peleg. Thank you ever so much for doing this, by the way. This well, is thank, you for ha- thank you very much for, for, for giving me the opportunity. This is a real treat for me because I didn't have any idea who Imshin was. And there's this yellow, blue and red cover, which uh, didn't really give anything away, apart from the fact that you may have been female. I'm, fe- I'm female, yes, as far as I know. People aren't sure. People still call me a he. So it, it didn't really work. But the greatest revelation for our British audience and our English speaking audience around the world is that you're from Liverpool. All right, Chuck. All right, La. <laughs> Originally. Originally, I've, be, I've I've lived in Israel all my life, so uh, yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic um, because uh, on the uh, bio it says you're a haphazard watcher of this, which implies that obviously you don't want to have to do this all the time, and yet you are drawn to this. And your videos are made up of Gazans bragging about their lives. This isn't special investigations. This is you basically looking in YouTube, looking around the rest of the internet and seeing actually that far from it being a prison camp, far from it being all the lies which are told about Gaza, which continue into this war, that actually up to October the 7th and even after October the 7th, a lot of Gazans are living normal lives. Right, exactly. I watch Gazans documenting their lives on social media. And there's something fascinating for me to be watching them as they want to be seen as opposed to um, how they are shown on the media as victims etc as um, I, I, I really love the way that we are seeing them not via the prism of the conflict and not for Israelis we have very much we see them in the prism of our relationship with them. And I get the opportunity, because I watch them on social media, as they're documenting themselves, is just to see them as they as they want to see themselves or as they want to, to, to show themselves, not as victims, to show their creativity. They are very innovative. They are very resilient, who could live well. They love showing it. They love bragging about it, exactly. But it's your journalism which is a real product of the social media age. You're blowing the top of the top-down mainstream media by exposing the uh, narrative, which is quite incorrect, about what's going on in Gaza. I was a visitor to Kerem Shalom literally weeks before the start of October the 7th. It was a time when Gazans were allowed in their thousands to come in and work in Israel. I even met a nurse who was a Palestinian Gazan who was working in a hospital for really sick children around Tel Aviv. And I was witness to Gazans working throughout Israel, not just in the south, in those kibbutzim who they betrayed, but in the north as well. And I could tell the difference between those who are Israeli Arabs and those who are Gazans, because I could sense In retrospect, I'm not a great wizard or magician, but I could sense that something was up. When I wished Gazans good morning, they wouldn't look me in the eye. There was tension between those who were Gazans and those who were Israeli Arabs um, working in hotels and various other places. I'd been a few times in Israel. Mm. And now the economy has been destroyed by October the 7th, hasn't it? From what I've seen, yes, but the, the IDF has recovered immense amount of money, cash, 
in in the tunnels that they've they've squirreled away. So we don't know how much more that we haven't uh, we haven't found that IDF hasn't found yet. Are these anyway. dollars? In, these are Qatari dollars, probably, aren't they? No, no shekels. They're shekels. They found shekels. They found dollars. It's interesting that you should say that the the, the Garsons didn't want to um, interact with you because they were making videos from Israel. The, the the workers, the Palestinian workers who Gazan workers who were coming into Israel, were making videos and showing showing the country uh, quite proudly because they see it as as their country. Um, and they were showing their work. They were showing themselves in. Um, in, uh, in 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 the places of uh, in the places they were working quite freely maybe the camera is a different scenario when it's on they behave differently uh but i'm talking about gardens who are sort of working without addressing a camera i presume is different yeah. the community in gaza uh, which as we found is all joined up there are so many people who are complicit in hamas within the citizenry, it's very difficult for IDF soldiers to actually know the difference between who is a soldier and who is a civilian. Uh, actually, that they knew in some detail and in some populace what was about to happen on October the 7th. Well, I had no idea. I We had, we had no idea. <laughs> but they did as a community. As, as someone, as someone who was watching, I was watching. The thing, I did see things that... In hindsight, uh, were interesting. For instance, for a long time, they seemed to be uh, investing a lot in tourism. They were building. They built a, a new road to the north, to, towards Sikkim, towards the uh, the the Israeli border, and they were selling plots of land. On, on that that strip of road that was going to be for, for for tourist attractions. Now that strip of road, that area, um, already was like a touristy area. They had there were there were hotels on that on that stretch, and there were they were building new beach resorts, and also they had something that was uh, very prevalent in in Gaza something they called chalets, which were rental villas with swimming pools that Gazans and Gaza, Gazan families and groups of Gazans used to rent, usually for the day or for the evening, not really to sleep over, but sometimes to sleep over as well. And they used to they used to have little holidays there. And there were a lot of them on that on that stretch of road towards the north, towards the Israeli border on the north, on the beach. There were loads of them and they were very, you know, the best ones. They, they, there's hundreds of these chalets all over the Gaza Strip. But on that stretch of road, they were the nicest ones and the best ones. Um, what else were they doing? They they were renovating the, uh, uh, what they call the Corniche, the, um, the promenade on the Gaza City front. And they were, they were building a, a, another Corniche on... Um, in Chanyones, they were trying to clean up the, the beaches from, from all sorts of, uh, um, they had sort of people uh, selling things on, on the beach and they had um, stalls and they were they were trying to run these people off. They were, uh, and, and to, to build nicer places, nicer uh, cafes and nicer resorts. Um, so this, this was all. This was always very strange because it was sort of um, okay. We're, we're building. We're building tourism. They even brought in a few tourists from um, Judea and Samaria, from Palestinian Authority area areas. From I think I saw one from Egypt to show how nice Gaza is and come here as tourists. So, you know, I thought. Okay, <laughs> they're trying to make a th they're building tourism. But after the eighth of the seventh, eighth of October, I started to realize that that was just a con. It was just uh, it wasn't real. A lot of things that they were building and developing, I don't know how how much of it was just for show. To show the Israelis that 
they weren't interested in war. There was a lot of construction going on. Hardly a day went past uh, without um, the opening of a new business, um, restaurant, cafe, all sorts of luxury uh, stores like the um, the luxury car dealership on the on the main on the main beach road. It was like this big glass building, beautiful <laughs> big glass building, and next to it they bid an, a, like it had a twin glass building which became a cafe. And there were all these speculations on TikTok, what it's going to be. They had, uh, they fantasized it will be KFC. They they love KFC, but actually they have KFC there. They have um, local equivalents of sort of fried chicken, which I am sure are much better than KFC because their food is fabulous. They had loads of restaurants and, you know, the, you see the foods there, Really, yeah, really impressive. So they built this beautiful car dealership. And the opening was, you never seen anything like it with um, pyrotechnic and um, and smoke and the whole of the whole of Gaza turned out. And this is in August. You might remember the um, during the uh, uh, marches of return around about 2018, 2019, they were sending incendiary balloons over burning uh, fields of people. And killing the, cows. The farmers in, in the south, yes. So I thought to myself, this was right at the beginning of when I was, I was watching. And I thought, well, that's it. They won't, they won't allow balloons in now. That's it for, for them. No, no more balloons for Gaza because I thought, you know, I, I believe the blockade. I believe there was a blockade. I believe things weren't going in. And I very quickly discovered that they love balloons in Gaza. There are every every event. There are hundreds of balloons. Every birthday, every um, sh- uh, shop opening, and there are a lot of shop openings. They have hundreds of balloons, and they had shops called balloons. They they had special gift shops where they sort of wrapped things up and had special. Um, presence with loads of balloons popping out and everything and that's you know that's a sort of sign that there really wasn't much of a blockade going on that everything was going in even things that were hurting Israel I mean I think the first thing was okay no more balloons but it just didn't happen and I just wanted to ask you about Mr Fafo who is up for an Oscar <laughs> uh, isn't he Oh, we have. He's all the time. He's on. We, so he was. He's been a doctor. Um, he's been a father. He's <laughs> been. Uh, he's been all sorts of uh, wonderful things. He's. Oh, been... he's still going very well. He's making a lot of money. He's getting donations. From what I've heard, he's been pocketing quite a lot of the donations that he's collected. He's going around in uh, an expensive SUV at the moment. Uh, Forty thousand dollar car, yeah. Um, he recently paid to get his his mother out. He said she's got she's ill, and she needed to leave for, for uh, to get a, a medical treatment. I hope for I hope for her that she gets it. So let me tell you a bit about uh, Mr. Fafo from the other side. Not from what we see. I, I've known him for, for years. I've been following him for, for a long time. He was a YouTuber, a singer. He didn't put out a lot of stuff, but he was um, he wasn't he wasn't uh, one of the big YouTubers and he wasn't famous. But I I, I, I used to I've, I've shared some of his stuff in in the past. You know, he was funny and uh, down to earth looking. There's there's one video with him where he goes to his his sister graduated from high school, so he goes with their mother to the gold market in Gaza City to buy her a gift for graduation. Um, so you see the the gold market. There's um was a very flourishing uh, gold business, gold trade in in Gaza. 
lot of uh, jewelry shops and uh, they make their own stuff and they import uh, they import gold and there's like a historic uh, gold market in Gaza city which they say it's like the ancient gold gold market well it turns out it wasn't a gold market it it is from the Mamlu the the actual market the buildings are from the uh, mamluk uh, era but it wasn't a it wasn't a gold market in the past it was it became a gold market this is from research i did it only became a gold market in the the israeli era gazans started to make uh, a lot of money which they didn't in the egyptian era they were very poor in the israeli era they made a lot of money and they wanted to invest it in something and they invested in gold so the market gradually became a gold market and now it's uh, the ancient uh, gold market from from uh, roman times when he started to become uh, famous on israeli tv and international tv and on social media as this uh, with all the memes and everything someone made a flyer saying in hebrew saying that he had been killed by idf dentist and a journalist and all you know all all, all the jokes about his his different roles he saw it or it was sent to him and he didn't understand it so he thought it said he, it was like a, a wanted dead or alive sort of thing and he you know he didn't no one bothered to translate it into arabic so they didn't realize it was a joke and they <laughs> <laughs> he became this, uh, and it was an Al Jazeera that the IDF had him on a on, on a list of people who need to be uh, to be eliminated. And uh, yeah, that a lot of his his uh, um, his fame in the Arab world, I think, came from this that he became sort of important to to the IDF. Uh, and I, I laughed at the time because I thought, well, if uh, IDF soldier gets their hands on him, they're going to take selfies with him because he's uh, he's like, he's so popular. Israel. <laughs> and he was sure he was like number one target. And he, he continues with this. He continues to, uh, to play on his fame and uh, try to cash in on it. You know, you're such an expert on life in Gaza over the last six years. Are you a consultant for anyone within government? I mean, you could almost be a cab driver down there, couldn't you? You know your way around. I deal with the fluff. You know, I I watch videos about restaurants and I watch the food bloggers Yes, there are food, blog food bloggers in Gaza. There were a lot of rests. They had a lot of work to do. I cover all the the openings. The I lifestyle. The You're shopping, the lifestyle edition. Shopping for clothes. I, I, that's the side I know is the, the ordinary side. You know, what, yeah. I don't know much about Hamas and I don't know much about the inner workings of government. And th th that's another thing that you see when you watch you watch Gaza's social media. You realize that Gaza was a de facto state with a government, with functioning municipalities. It was a state. It was an independent state. They did what they wanted. So that this this was something that was very very clear to someone who was who was following and as I was following just the ordinary ordinary people documenting themselves is that you could see that there was a government there were government um, different uh, 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 government ministries uh, all belonging to Hamas the municip municipalities all belonged to Hamas the, you, you saw the police patrolling the streets. You, you could see it very well during during COVID that they control the situation very strictly, much more strictly than, than, than anywhere else that I'd seen. There was never a famine in Gaza. There were famines in Egypt. There was starvation in Egypt. There was never starvation in Gaza. Since October the 7th, there's been a lot made by the NGOs and Hamas and the international media about a famine in Gaza. By your estimation and your watching of videos, is there a famine in Gaza or is it created by Hamas taking, appropriating the aid and then selling it at hugely inflated prices to the poorest of people? 
What is the famine or non-famine situation in Gaza Strip today, Jackie? I have seen no evidence of a famine in Gaza. Again, I don't watch Hamas propaganda. I watch videos that ordinary people make. They have complained about shortages at certain points. Most of the problems, the shortages were solved as more and more food came in. There were points where food was very expensive. I know that food was coming in all the time. But as you say, Hamas was appropriating it and um, and selling it to the markets. I watch the people in the streets. There are poor people. There are always poor people. You don't see emaciated people. People have energy. The markets are full. Now, there was a point where North Gaza wasn't getting food as much because People, because people in the south were raiding the trucks. You had these aid trucks on their way to the north, and they were being raided by by uh, by Gazans in the in the south, and they weren't reaching. But um, as the food, there was more and more food in the south, and prices started coming down. They stopped raiding the the trucks in the south. And uh, and trucks started arriving in the north and solved the problems. So there were there was a while where the, the I think living was difficult in the north, but that is not the situation now. They have plenty of uh, flour. Some bakeries have reopened in the north. Lots of bakeries are functioning in the south, but they have them now in the north. A few shawarmas have opened in the north as well. There is food. There is food. And uh, there's, there's, there's one guy called Hussein, who I follow, who gives updates about prices in the north. He's in Gaza City and he gives updates how much things cost. Israelis, when they see my videos saying, giving the prices, current prices in Rafah, current prices in Gaza City, they laugh because it's cheaper than in Israel. Now, before October 7th, Everything was very, very cheap in Gaza, very cheap. You'd pay very little for food there. So, of course, for a Gazan, paying more is astronomical. So you would say to that, well, they don't have the money to pay. Somehow they are paying. I mean, if, if you're asking for a high price in the market, someone is paying that price. Otherwise, they bring the price down. If no one could buy it, then they bring the price down. Um, and they're not. Well, eventually they had because competition was such that they had to bring the prices down. They are also getting food now from the north. From Erez Crossing is open and trucks of aid are coming in via Israel. They were airdropping uh, food. The Americans, the Jordanians were airdropping food. Well, that, it, it was a bit of a joke because a whole day of airdropping would drop on them the amount that one truck would bring in. So it was more sort of that people will see that uh, sending in food and they didn't really like these MREs the Americans were sending. They, they, they prefer to get real food and to uh, make their own. They, w one thing they, they're talking a lot, they talk a lot, uh, um, especially in the South, but also in the North, that they are fed up of canned food. They're getting all these can, cans of food and they're completely fed up of it. Yeah, they're used they to a want... higher quality of food than the yes. American. The poor Palestinians give them toothpaste in a tube where actually they're used to kind of the, the a, a, a Mediterranean life. You know, they live by the coast. They have, they're a kind of land of plenty. It's a ridiculous well, situation there, for people to understand. The food there, well, food in Gaza is wonderful. I mean, they're, they're wonderful cooks. They make wonderful food. They love fresh meat. They love to make everything from, from scratch. They don't like produced food. So after a few months of eating canned food they really sick and they say that we're sick of it we're sick of it we want real food we want meat we want 
So uh, at one point, a lot of chicken started coming in. Right. So they were eating. They were eating a lot of chicken. Even when there weren't bakeries working, they were making their own. Uh, they were making their own bread. Gas, cooking gas, comes and goes. So they cook with uh, on wood burners. Yes. So they've gone a lot back to sort of traditional cooking ways. With the, they have these clay ovens, which is like the traditional cooking way, and they know how to to cook like that. So they they went back to that. You have sixty five thousand followers on Twitter for this extraordinary vocation that you've created. Jackie, you must have contact with Garzans themselves, people on DM with you regularly. Do you respond to those people? Well, sometimes uh, I, I sometimes I'm I'm attacked by oh, right. Garzans, so I get a lot of uh, sort of hate mail, which I ignore, obviously. I have had periods where I've been in contact with Garzans. Uh, I've had uh, Garzans who support what I'm doing. Look, most Garzans don't speak English. Uh, uh, Hamas propaganda is in English, so you get the feeling that they know English, that they're more educated than they are. Most Garzans do not speak English. A lot of them speak Ivrit, though, don't they? Uh, Only if the older ones, people who who worked in Israel in the olden days... That's mainly or people who are in prison in Israel. That's mm. who will know Hebrew. So I haven't really been much in contact with Garzans, much less than other commentators, you know, as I call them, the serious commentators, the ones who who really know the the Gazan innings and outings of politics and everything. That's not me. Also, I have uh, made an effort not to be in contact with Garzans over the years because I don't want to put them in danger. Because being in contact with me could be could be problematic for them. People who would contact me or try to connect with me might be not independent players. And there have been there have been a lot of that. We saw that on the seventh of October, that uh, people who had been in contact with Israelis in the kibbutzim turned out to be Hamas operatives. Do you sense I- any revolt amongst the uh, population, given that the IDF has removed a lot of the Hamas leadership, that actually? They might be helped along the IDF by a revolt by the people as they find that their Hamas stronghold is being loosened. There has been a beginning of revolts of people daring to speak out more than they would have. I think now, with the support Hamas is getting internationally and from the US, people are probably realizing that it's not a good idea to come out against Hamas. Now, all the time that I've been following Gaza, there has been uh, opposition. There's been opposition to to Hamas. There's the Fatah, what's left of Fatah in in Gaza. There have been powerful clans that have been weakened by Hamas because they were were opposition. And um, there have been, occasionally, there have been uprisings. Uh, there was one in March 2019, end of July 2023, there was an uprising. And each time they try to uprise, they are put down very, very brutally. People go to prison, people disappear, people are beaten. They open fire on, on protesters. It's very difficult to oppose Hamas. Uh, There was one story, this man, he was a journalist, and he uh, published a a story about corruption in donations to the needy. He was like at the top of a a charity director or something, and the uh, the journalist hadn't realised was that he was connected to Hamas. 
Now, what he was doing was he was demanding um, sexual favors from women, needy women in Gaza in return for food. He was inviting these women to come to apartments and to chalets. And uh, some of them even were widows of shaheeds who have a sort of elevated shaheeds and their families, the martyrs, have a sort of elevated status in Palestinian uh, society. And even they were trying to, uh, to extort like this. So he was hauled into uh, to interrogation. He came out and he uh, published an apology. You know, I was mistaken, it's all wrong, I didn't know what I was talking about. And um, a few, few months later, he was thrown out of Gaza without his wife. And as far as I know, he's, he's still gone. You know, he, he was never allowed to come back. Um, it's very difficult to oppose Gaza. There is an opposition in uh, outside of outside of Gaza, but they when the war started, they all sort of um, closed ranks because the Mukawama, the resistance, as it were, which is really a, a sort of a violence fight, violent fight against Israel, trumps everything. So they pull together. So you've got like the, the, the main opposition to Hamas in exile is now part of the of the war effort, as it were. This is also something that happened in Gaza. Uh, during war, if you oppose Hamas, you're cooperating with the enemy. So people won't do that. Because as much as they may hate Hamas, and they hate a lot of people hate Hamas, they hate Israel more and they hate the Jews more. And that's like the common enemy above everything. As you have painted this extremely vivid picture of Gaza and Gazans, however much they hate Hamas, they hate the Jews more, they hate Israelis more. We can unseat the government of Hamas. We can unseat the military. Uh, there is recent evidence, of course, Al-Qaeda was unseated in Iraq and Syria. But to unseat the consensus of what is broadly called the Palestinian people is a hatred that will last beyond our lifetime, isn't it? We've got 70 years of indoctrination and brainwashing and also, you have to remember that Gazans don't know Israelis. The, the younger generation don't know Israel and don't know Israelis. Before the Oslo Accords, Gazans knew Israelis. Gazans knew Jews. They knew we didn't have horns. They knew we had a merciful side. A lot of them knew that they could be, we could be good employees for, for employers, for instance. There were connections, people used to come to weddings. They're very, very hospitable people, so they invited their Israeli friends to their, to their weddings, to their homes. I had Gazan friends before the Oslo Accords. Mm -hmm. They knew I wasn't an ogre. They knew I wasn't uh, a terrible person. But now the divide is such, and the indoctrination is such, that unless very, very deep changes happen in, in Palestinian society, in Gazan society, I don't see much hope for change, I'm sadly, sad to say. This is something I discovered when I was starting to to learn about Gaza and to, to watch Gaza it, it was a deep sadness because I realized that um, it's not good let's say it's not a good situation at all and this separation between us hasn't been good for the way they see it it hasn't improved the way they see us it's something that the Gazans believe very deeply is that 
with their terrorism and with their violent actions, they managed to get rid of the Jews. This is a great, a, a, a great military success. What happened in 2005 that Israel disengaged from Gaza completely, that Israel left Gaza, is seen as a win for, for violence. And it's seen as a way to get rid of the, the Jews completely. We just have to do the same, do more and more of the same inside Israel, and the Jews will leave. And this is the way to go. Violence is the way to go. That's what they learned from the disengagement of 2005. There was a, a big business of second-hand European EU cars coming in, two, three years old, and they were doing a, a great business with these cars. If I, I don't see why the these luxury cars wouldn't come in from Israel via Israel either, but they 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 import stuff via Ashdod um, port, and they had they had importers who were coming in and out of Israel, and they had special uh, sort of visas licenses to come into Israel. And you had you had very rich businessmen and importers who were who were importing uh, goods all the time, and these were very very rich people. And you, sometimes you could see family members were putting were were, uh, were documenting themselves. So you could see they lived in these enormous mansions, fabulous, all gold, and yeah. and, and and they they had the, the the best cars, of course. They were the um, they were very ostentatious. Um, so I, I, I can't say that everything was coming through the tunnels at all because everything, hundreds of trucks with goods were going in via Israel all the time. I mean, the supermarkets were, were fully stocked, very with, with everything, everything, but not just Israeli goods at all. I mean, they had much more um, choice than in Israeli supermarkets, because in Israeli supermarkets, you have everything has to be kosher. We have very strong food monopolies. So they had more, more options and more choice than in, in, in Israeli supermarkets. And, and the supermarkets also was, was like a, a thing. They were building supermarkets all the time and they were big and they were beautiful. What, they bought one of the built one of these beautiful supermarkets in Nusirat, in the center of, of, of Gaza Strip, which is ostensibly a refugee camp. And um, You must put that in, these... in parentheses, in inverted commas. Yes, because the, the refugee camps were sort of a political statement. They weren't really refugee camps. The, the, they were slums. Yes. On, on the whole, they were, they were run-down uh, neighborhoods. They were completely built up. Um, I think Gazans now are discovering what a refugee really means, sadly. But uh... yes, quite. I, I want to ask you here that you know you described uh, all these developments that you'd seen leading up to October the seventh as a giant subterfuge, a con, in your words. But may I ask you this: that actually it might not have been a con. That actually the leadership in Qatar uh, and Turkey actually weren't a party to the military wing of Hamas. There's talk that not only did it surprise Iran and Hezbollah, who would planned this sort of massacre, uh, and that was taken from them in terms of surprise, uh, but it also caught the leadership in absentia by surprise as well, that Hamas aren't quite as joined up as we all thought. Because I spoke to Javiv Retigur and Jonathan yeah. Squire about this. And of course, they're talking about, and many other commentators are talking about a failure in Israeli imagination, that they really thought that Hamas was sort of approaching this idea of, well, here we are building supermarkets and skyscrapers, encouraging tourism. Uh, and we're accepting the millions of dollars which we're turning a blind eye in, paper bags coming in from Qatar. So actually, this new idea that we can allow visas and allow thousands of Gazans in was actually a giant subterfuge. And in fact, uh, in, in dealing only with the ruling class, Israel was con too. 
Well, when you see the discourse among Gazans, ordinary Gazans, not, not the leadership, the animosity to Israel and to Jews and um, the Zionist entity was very, very strong. You couldn't miss it. The education, I used to watch street interviews. YouTubers did like these uh, jokey street interviews. And a lot of them were, say, they had one that they used to do where they used to come out with an Israeli flag and, flag and say, I'm, uh, I support Israel. And people passing by used to come and beat them up. And no, 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 it's just a prank stop. Kindergarten graduation ceremonies, they had these parties and they had, you know, they used to make a, a big thing of it. And in every kindergarten graduation celebration, they had a, a military... Cosplay. Or, or, what do you call it? Yes, yes, they had them all dressed up in military fatigues and they'd run around and they'd wave toy guns around. They even had in one one of them they had like a surprise uh announcement at the end of the they they were running around with their guns and then they had this big announcement in which they said uh we've had a a, a special announcement israel has been has fallen as it were the resistance has conquered israel the last Zionist has left and we've freed all of Palestine. And everyone's uh, clapping and cheering. And they had, they had, they had these all the time, uh, these, these, these celebrations. They acted out a lot what they want to do. The, the, the children in school as well. But I especially followed the, 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 the graduations of the, the little children in the kindergarten because they were starting young. And this is how the, the, these people um, saw the world and see, see the world. So this doesn't, uh, this isn't uh, really a situation of um, coming to terms with Israel's existence. This is a building a population which feels it is its right to destroy Israel. It, it's its right, it is its uh, mission to destroy Israel. They see Gaza as a pit stop towards their inevitable return. This terrible war will continue long after Israel, in inverted commas, wins this war and unseats Hamas. We have a United States which is determined to stop the incursion into Rafah because of the presumably hundreds of thousands of Gazans sheltering there. But Israel must go into Rafah to defeat the final battalions and maybe, just maybe, God willing, bring home some of the human shield hostages that are there. Um, the situation in Rafah before was was really was really good. They had everything. They were living ordinary lives. A lot of them were, were displaced, but they were they had enough food, and they were starting to uh, they were opening schools. Uh, businesses were opening. They had lots of shawarma restaurants working, and um, now. I, I know one of the one of the things that the US is saying is that they don't see how all these people can 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 evacuate. Well, I'm seeing videos. What I'm seeing now is videos of people evacuating. They're getting in, in cars, they're getting on trucks, and they're moving their tents to a new place. They're not happy about it, obviously. It's it's terrible. It's terrible and it's difficult. But it is a matter of packing up a, t a tent and moving the tent to a new, a new location. And they're doing it. And it's, it's not really a big problem. It's not the big problem that it's being uh, portrayed. It is doable and they are doing it. As soon as they feel that they're in, their, their lives are in danger, they get up and go. Which is what has been happening all the time in this war is that when 
they they uh, get warning from the IDF and they get plenty of warning. They get uh, flyers from fr from uh, they get flyers. They get they they call them up on the phone. The uh, uh, IDF spokesman in Arabic tells them again and again. They get up and go. Jackie, as I mentioned before, your journalism is a product of the social media age. Uh, you are exposing uh, the mainstream media and indeed leading politicians, uh, their narrative to be, well, let's just say they are lies or they follow a certain discourse and that it's not a prison camp and that, in fact, they have brought this failing upon themselves. And yet your videos do expose the idea that rather than blaming the Hamas leadership, they will still blame the Jews for this downfall, won't they? Well, I, first of all, I don't see myself as a journalist. I'm just... You're a citizen's uh, journalist by the definition. <laughs> by the definition I'm just someone... This old, sitting, long in the, this old, this old just, long in the tooth <laughs> journalist would call you a citizen's journalist for what you're doing. It, it is brilliantly done. It is very, very disciplined. I know exactly what I'm going to get from Imshin. Um, it's a brilliant resource. And you are changing the narrative. People can't just freely call it a prison camp anymore because you have exposed them as liars. I think what I show is that there was plenty of money in Gaza. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't distributed uh, fairly. I mean, there were, bil there were billions in aid were coming in, but they weren't reaching um, everyone. There was a, a class of people who were very rich. There was another class of people who were, you could say, middle class, which I wasn't, that, that was my big surprise, What the, was that there was a, a middle class in Gaza. And Hamas, it, it was in their interest to leave a lot of people very poor. Because they were they were their, they were in their hands. They were their uh, they could get them use them as as cannon fodder, send them to the borders to riot, and they could sell them this uh, fantasy that they soon they were going to go back to their homes. Their homes don't exist anymore, of course, but they were go they could go back to their homes inside Israel, which they can't. But they were selling this, them this fantasy. And the stronger that Hamas got, and um, the more successful they seem to be, Gazans bought into this because they were doing, um, they had these military marches all the time. They had military marches and they seemed to be very powerful. And everyone knew they were building under Gaza. Hamas told them, and they believed, that the Israelis were, were cowards and they would never dare go into, go into Gaza. And they believed this. Can I talk about the consequences it has upon you to watch this day after day after day? These are psychopathic neighbours who want to kill everyone north of the border. And I know, like you, I find some of the constant detailing of the war against Israel and the war against the Jewish diaspora extremely tiring but like you I feel drawn back to it all the time this is a this is a kind of mission for you isn't it you have found um, a corner of Israeli life that needs to be chronicled like no one else does you're drawn back to it all the time aren't you Jackie um, well I've, I've been doing it for I think about six years now since I discovered, I discovered it completely by mistake. It, it actually, until 7th of October, it, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was draining or difficult because I was watching people going about their lives and showing their lives. And it was, it was fun. Um, I, I watched hours and hours of YouTubers um, just just talking about their lives and showing their lives and doing challenges and um, you know all these all these uh, silly things that YouTubers do. I mean, they were doing them in Gaza, and um, they had they had 
big stars. I mean, I was, and um, another thing that I, I watched a lot was the advertisements. They were advertising um, um, little businesses, big businesses. They were they were advertising themselves, um, and and I was fascinated because I discovered it. By mistake, I thought what everyone else thought. I thought that everyone was poor. I thought that they uh, had terrible shortages, and I discovered it just wasn't true. And yet, to go back to your to your question, it started to be difficult after the seventh of October, um, because you know I didn't. <laughs> I, I it, it it was just like I didn't want to know anymore. You know what I mean? I I, I know exactly what you mean. It, it becomes uh, 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 it becomes a real um, toll on one's condition that there can be so much hatred. Um, there's only about two minutes left on on this call, so the final question is, and it's one of hope, which is that there are. Arab leaders in the Gulf who say that we are also the children of Abraham and that we are part of the region. We talk about MBZ and MBS, inshallah, good God willing, the Bahraini leader, the Moroccan king who is commanded by his ancestors to look after the Moroccan Jewish population uh, through time. Gaza is raised in many, many areas and destroyed. Is there any way that the Saudis, the UAE, Bahrain, the Sunni leadership, which says that Israel and the Jewish people are part of the region, can go into Gaza to rebuild it and create a new Sunni-based, more peaceful orientated Palestinian Authority with a small a. I'm afraid to say I don't see that happening. I don't see, why would they? Because of the building contracts, because of the billions of dollars involved, and also the threat that Muslim Brotherhood continues to pose to them. Because if Egypt falls, then they're across the border. You know, it's kind of self-interest. Not only is it business, billions of dollars worth of uh, of new influence but also the idea that they knock iran that they reduce their influence to the south towards north africa and towards them in the gulf i really don't think that the gulf leaders or the saudis would want to get involved i don't think so and I'm, I'm i'm afraid i don't see it happening <laughs> i'm sorry to, no it's, to, it's okay uh, uh, you talk with with, with tremendous uh, detail, with, with passion and with knowledge. Jackie Peleg, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Johnny Gould's Jewish State. Thank you very much for having me. That was tremendous. Thank you very much.